fine with the lights as they are. That's okay. Everybody okay? Yeah. See the screen? Okay. Um, Peter is fine, by the way. In court, Mr. Lush will serve, but uh, we're in a very much more informal uh, um, setting. Um, thank you for inviting me and coming out on a, a rather cold, wet evening. Um, I'm going to read this. I thought if I try to do this from notes, I'll go off on tangents, repeat things, and we'll all be here at half past ten and I won't have finished. This should be about three quarters of an hour. Do ask questions at the end. I am slightly deaf, so I can't hear you, I'll say. And if you can't hear at the back, please say as well. Um, right. Over the years, many rugby league players have been from South Wales. Until 1995, when rugby union went open and allowed payment to, to players, going north was the only way they could be properly financially rewarded for their rugby skills. Roy finished his involvement with rugby league in 1977, 45 years ago. He died at the age of 70 in 1989. So why, apart from the fact he's from Brimrah, by the way, my Welsh pronunciation is appalling, apologies in advance, um, should we spend an evening talking about him? First of all, he was the first black player to play for Great Britain at Rugby League. He played against New Zealand in December 1947 and scored two tries for a winning team. And those tries meant that Great Britain won that particular series. It's fair to say he was a very good Rugby League player. But far more interesting, as I'll come on to, is his work as a coach. And if you look at professional sport now, at the top level, there aren't that many black coaches now let alone in the 50s and 60s when Roy was, was very active. The biography I've written is based on newspaper, book and magazine research. I'm fortunate that Training Link, where I'm trying to retire from, is literally round the corner from the British Library. And I was in the newsroom so often that the staff would recognise me. It's that bloke with the beard again, their funny glasses, asking for the Hull or Leeds papers. Um, the only interview I did was with Jeff and Anne Francis, Roy's son and daughter-in-law. I couldn't contact Ian Francis, Roy's other son. I also listened to an interview by Alan Golding, who I'm pleased to say is here tonight, uh, from the BBC, with Jeff and Anne, which gave me valuable background material. My aim, apart from telling the story of Roy's career, was to give him a voice. And what I mean by that is I was looking for stuff that he had said directly in interviews or in articles for the local press, or the rugby press on occasions. I tried to use any articles he'd written, reports of meetings, and sometimes they had sportsmen's forums, particularly when he was in Hull, and he'd speak on behalf of rugby league, there'd be someone there from union, from football, from cricket, and so on. Um, however, during his time at Hull in particular, it was the club chairman, Ernest Hardacre, who spoke to the press about club affairs, not the coach. Very different from today when the coaches of the top teams in any sport are all over the papers. The other problem I had was um, the late Saturday afternoon football special editions of the local and regional papers are not kept at the British Library. I'm sure people of my age, I'm 68, will remember these from when we were kids. They'd come out at 6 o'clock, there was no internet in those days. You could get a report on your team that, and uh, in London we used to get them with all the London teams and all the results and you could see how low my particular teams were in the table. But those football specials aren't in the, the newspaper archives which is incredibly frustrating. I know that Roy wrote for the one in Hull at uh, particular times. Um, apart from his rugby league activities, which of course in those days were part time, all the players had jobs. Um, both as a player, player coach and coach, he was part-time. Roy was also a successful businessman. <coughs> With his wife Irene, generally known as Rini, um, he ran a clothing shop in Wigan. When he moved to Hull, they ran a successful cafe in Beverley and subsequently ran various pubs and cafes. I'm not planning to say much more about Roy's business activities. I think it's a separate story. And it's also very interesting that a black person in a mixed marriage, which often wasn't acceptable in the 50s, could successfully, and 60s, could successfully 
run pubs where probably most of their clientele were white. But that's a whole area that needs further explanation. I'm a rugby historian and uh, I'd concentrated on that. There's also an element of mystery about Roy's birth and even what his correct name was. Um, I hope this is going to work. No other way. Um, his mother was a white woman called Evans. She had, a, and this is my, as far as I can work out from what I found out, I believe that she had an affair with Roy's father, Albert. And when Roy was born in Port Talbot in January 1919, his birth mother realised that she could not keep him. The social pressures and stigma at that time of a white woman having a black baby would have been very challenging. Albert persuaded his wife Rebecca to adopt Roy, and he's listed in the 1921 census as adopted son. So race was a part of his life from the very beginning. Roy's correct name was Lionel Roy Francis, but he was always known as Roy. Rebecca was black and had a daughter, although Jeff has no memory of meeting his, uh, his, her daughter. Roy also had a younger brother who was a musician who moved to London. And again, I haven't really been able to explore those areas. Certainly, um, Jeff, who was born in 1939 and is now 82, he <coughs> coming to Brimra on holiday and, and staying with Rebecca, who he said was a formidable woman. Um, and, um, but he, as I say, beyond that, he has no memories of meeting Albert, who also wasn't listed in the, in the census. Um, however, he worked as a sailor and may have been away. In 1911, Rebecca was living in Brimra and Roy grew up in Brimra. He also regarded the, the town as his home. And Jeff recalls going to the 1958 Empire Games in Cardiff with Roy and visiting relatives in Brimra as part of that trip. Jeff also... Um, <coughs> Probably after the war, Jeff would come and, and, and Ian would come and stay with Rebecca during the school holidays. Roy went to a local school. His first sporting love was boxing, and he returned to that in later life. He seems to have been one of those natural athletes. Now, I don't know about you, but I was pretty hopeless at sports at school. I think my best role in sports is what I do now, writing history, not trying to play football. Um, but he was a natural athlete, and there are reports in the local press of his success in athletics and swimming, and he also played rugby union. In August 1936, he was planning to do some swimming training in Cardiff, but was asked to play in a trial match at the local rugby club, as one side was a player short. He had not played rugby for four years. He was then invited to play for the first team and played four matches early in the 1936-37 season. I may be going over stuff people know here, but it's important to outline briefly the relationship between rugby union and rugby league at this time. We could spend the rest of the evening talking about this, but it's not what we're here for. From the late 1880s, there were disputes between the leadership of rugby union in England and some northern clubs. The rugby union officials could see how association football at the top level, had been taken over, taken over by working class players playing as professionals. Rugby Union, they were determined to keep their game as amateur, in inverted commas, and keep control of it. <coughs> Most of the leading clubs in the north, in Yorkshire and Lancashire, had a more commercial outlook than the sort of middle class and upper class clubs in the south. Um, they played in cups and leagues, and things like the Yorkshire Cup in the 1880s got better attendances than the FA Cup. Um, they wanted to be able to pay their players initially just for what was called broken time. Working class players, they'd probably work a Saturday morning shift in the factory or wherever they worked and then go off and play. If they were playing away, they'd have to miss that shift and lose money. And they wanted to be compensated if they missed work and lost money because of travelling to a game. Rugby union did not allow this and clubs and players were suspended for alleged breaches of the rules on professionalism. Things came to a head in 1895. 22 northern clubs left the rugby union in, a, in that year, had a meeting in the George Hotel in Huddersfield, which until a couple of years ago, you could actually go and have a look at the room where rugby league was founded. Sadly now the buildings, I don't know what's happened to it, but you can't get into it anymore. Um, and they set up the Northern Union, 
which became, in 1922, the Rugby Football League. After this, any rugby union player who played rugby league would be banned from playing rugby union, even if they just got up north, had a trial match, been paid their train fare, and decided it wasn't for them. If they got caught, they were out. Even to talk to a rugby league scout could result in a ban. Almost a hundred years to the day after the 1895 split, rugby union went open and allowed professionalism. Players now can and do play both codes, and to me that's a very good thing. From its earliest days, the rugby league clubs regarded South Wales as a potential talent pool. A lot, but not all, English rugby union was middle class. Nice income, no need to go north to actually get some real money. But in South Wales, particularly in tough economic times, working class players could be tempted to go north with a signing on fee and weekly payments for playing. The club they were joining would usually help them find work, but there was no going back. If they didn't adapt to rugby league, which gradually became different from union, quicker, only 13 players and so on, um, which by, um, and certainly by the First World War was quite a different game because it needed to be more attractive to watch for clubs that relied on their gate income. Um, if they didn't adapt, their rugby union <coughs> games were over. Sometimes they'd play union under pseudonyms, but there was always the risk of being recognised. Anyway, back in 1936, Roy was invited to play a game for Abitulary, a bigger club than Grimoire. But before he played, a Wigan scout, all the big rugby league teams had scouts in South Wales. And uh, sometimes they'd be recognised and thrown out of the rugby union grounds because the rugby union teams didn't want to lose another player to the north. Anyway, he was invited to play a couple of trial games for Wigan's second team. How did he keep this a, play, a secret in a small place like this? People would be asking, why can't you play on Saturday? <coughs> anyway, he played twice and then signed for Wigan in 1936. And Wigan were one of the very top teams. This is the equivalent in football to signing for Manchester United or Manchester City these days. Um, it was an open secret that rugby, black, rugby union black players were not chosen to play for Wales at this time. The black British population was quite small, but black players had one representative honours in rugby league. Was this a factor in Roy's reasons for going north? Probably not. He wouldn't have had international aspirations when he was just signing for his first club. It was probably, because there was you know, not good economic times in, uh, in South Wales, the chance of a job, and also to use his sporting talent to actually earn an income. He needed to learn his new code, and mainly played in the second team for the rest of that season. As I said, Wigan were one of the top clubs, and throughout his time at the club, Roy faced considerable competition for a first team place. He wasn't even 20 years old, and Wigan had established internationals on the wing, which is mainly where Roy played at that time. In those days, floodlights generally weren't in use in professional sport, so that if there was a backlog of fixtures, they'd be played in the spring evenings, after the clocks had gone forward or back or whatever, um, towards the end of the season. In that first season, Roy played five first team games and scored seven tries which is a very good return. Um, however, the next season, he only played three times for the first team, scored a try. And in his final season at Central Park, Wigan's ground, he played four first team games. In July 1938, he married Irene Austin, the daughter of the family he lodged with. In the, those days, I suppose now as well, the local press always had wedding photos, because it was a good way of selling newspapers. And I couldn't find one for Roy. I tried two or three different Wigan papers. I checked that they'd got married in Wigan. No photo. And I just wonder now, I haven't put this in the book, whether disapproval of what was known as a mixed marriage was why there was no photo in the paper. I mean, Guy played for Wigan. He was well known in the town. Why no photo? Interesting. A couple were married for 50 years. So it was a marriage that lasted, despite the pressure that was on it. In September 1938, an Australian, Harry Sunderland, was appointed as secretary manager, like chief executive really, at Wigan. In January 13, 1939, Roy was transferred to Barrow. <coughs> Roy said in an interview 
that Sunderland made it clear to him that this was because of the colour of his skin. And certainly there was quite heavy racism in Australia at that time. It's not fair to say every Australian was racist, as with South Africa under apartheid, the same thing. But Roy made it said that. And a letter, I've seen letters in the local paper that said that players of lesser ability were being kept by the club. Certainly, the success Roy went on to have, away from Wigan, proves that he shouldn't have been sold. There's no reason to dispute what Roy believed, but there's no other reports, to be fair to Sunderland, who played quite a major role in rugby league, of him behaving in this way to other black players. But having said that, there weren't many other black players around. There were some, but very not that many. And in fact, I think that it did Roy a favour. He became an established first-team player at Barrow, who weren't such a good club. And he scored eight tries in the half-season he had at Barrow before the war started. And he was seen as a success. Being an established first-team player as a professional sportsman was important when he later joined the army. This is Roy, Irene and Jeff, probably soon after Jeff was born in January 1939. It's just a nice family photo. Um, okay, in September 1939, Second World War started. After a short break, uh, rugby league and other team sports continued to play uh, with travel and other restrictions. This was a different approach from the First World War where there was very little active sport, particularly after 1916. Um, now it was recognised that civilian morale could benefit from watching sport in their, in their areas. Roy was called up quite early in the war, because they did it on a sort of age thing, uh, age uh, range, and he was called up in October 1939, only played a couple more games for Barrow that season. His next games for the club were in 1945. In the army, after he'd sort of settled down, he was in the south of England for a period, that's where his uh, son Ian was born, Roy applied to become a physical training instructor. It was common for professional sportsmen to take on this role. I don't know if people remember Joe Mercer, who was um, again Manchester City, big football manager, England manager on a temporary basis. In his book, he talks about how he joined up. And they were promised the, the footballers were promised extra money, which they weren't given, um, and they weren't happy with that. But it was common for a professional sportsman to take on this role. On the same court training course as Roy was Trevor Foster, who had joined Bradford Northern from war, uh, from Newport before the war. Given the small size of the Black British population. You get an awful lot written, and quite rightly so, about people who came from the Caribbean and other colonies, as they were then, to fight for what they still called the motherland. There's, I found relatively little, certainly not much, as much use, on the black British population, because it was small, and how many were eligible through age and, uh, and so on. To join the army is probably even smaller. Um, anyway, give, Roy achieved the rank of sergeant, which must have been rare for a black man. In the First World War, army regulations did not allow black soldiers to become officers. And that was a barrier famously broken by former professional footballer Walter Tull. We published the second edition of um, Phil Vassily's biography of Walter. I bought a couple, sorry, quick commercial. I bought a couple of copies long tonight, but um, if you look at the programs around Armistice Day, Roy is often, often mentioned. Uh, Walter, sorry, is often mentioned. Um, later in the war, after the troops had gone off to fight and were fit to fight, Roy's role changed to working to rehabilitate injured soldiers. And it's clear to me that his experience in both areas helped him develop the training, coaching, and man management skills he used later in his career. Roy seems to be someone who always drew on the experiences he had, and uh, I think that was very important. Rugby league was not recognised in the armed forces at this time. This is a whole other story, which we actually also did a book on. It wasn't until 1994 that, you could, that rugby league was allowed to be played in the British armed forces. But professional rugby league players were allowed to play rugby union in services matches. They could fight together, they could play sport together. And um, 
Roy next played rugby league for Dewsbury in, a, in West Yorkshire, near Leeds, um, in April 1941. The team was managed by a young guy called Eddie Waring, and anyone who watched rugby league in the 60s and 70s and did some knockout, God help us, um, will remember Eddie Waring. He later became the BBC's rugby league commentator, he became a very well known journalist, and one of us, to be fair, was one of the sport's leading advocates. <coughs> He signed up good quality players who were based in Yorkshire as guest players. Barrow had stopped, and if a lot of the clubs stopped, sometimes the grounds were used for military purposes. And um, they could be guest players, either if their club wasn't playing, or they couldn't travel to where their club was playing, or their club had, had packed up for the war. Um, Roy played the first game when he was based in the south, and he was interviewed later and, and said how it took him hours and hours to get from his camp in the south to Dewsbury. But then he was posted to, up north to, to Yorkshire, and um, he, he joined Dewsbury for 41, 42. Barrow weren't playing at that time. However, Army Rugby Union, because he was a serving soldier, took priority, and Roy, play, Roy played in a number of Army Rugby Union matches despite his lack of experience in that code, he'd only played four games at a relatively junior level for Brunoir. It's difficult, <coughs> to be honest, to find good records of these fixtures. They are the high, the, some are in the national press, some aren't. Often they won't give the team, because the team that actually played was the different from the one that was selected for all sorts of reasons, military reasons, travel reasons, and so on. Um, Anyway, he did play regularly for Dewsbury at Rugby League and also in some representative fixtures in Rugby League. A lot of these games they used to make, raise money for wartime charities that were actually quite important. Anyway, in February 1943, he was chosen to play Rugby League for Wales in a wartime international. But a senior army officer said he couldn't do that, not allowed to play for Wales at Rugby League, Roy. So he'd been selected for the England rugby union services team to play against Scotland on the same day. The power of the military officers. You're going to not even really play the, right, the other sport, you're going to play for England, not Wales. Because there was a Welsh team, Trevor Foster played for it regularly. Um, anyway, scored a try, kept his place in a defeat against Wales, and then was chosen to play for, at Leicester in the return match against Scotland. He arrived at Welford Road, Leicester's ground then, after a difficult journey from Yorkshire, only to find that the gatemen wouldn't let him in. They were clearly racist. They were saying things like, this wants to play for England. And it took intervention from the England team manager, and apparently an argument, before Roy was actually allowed into the ground. Now, and it's difficult to find examples of blatant racism against Roy, but that's clearly one. Without going off on a complete tangent, there was a famous case a couple of years later involving Suleri Constantine, the famous West Indian cricketer, who had booked to play a hotel at Russell Square to play in a charity match at Lord's. When he got there, him and his family were refused admission. They eventually did stay there for one night, and he actually did a case, took a legal case against them, and one, he got five pounds compensation. Um, time doesn't really allow for a more detailed coverage of Roy's rugby during the war. He played seven times for England and played in both matches. I've got to mention this. When a rugby league 15 beat a rugby union 15. Did you, um, at rugby union, of course. He also won honours for Dewsbury. He often played well in the wartime matches, so though to be quite honest, the, the opposition sometimes wasn't that strong. As I said, some players sometimes wouldn't turn up. It wasn't unknown for players who were in the crowd to suddenly be roped into play, and so on. Um, yeah, I thought I'd got a picture behind. That's the at odds on the big stadium in Bradford, rugby league against rugby union, organised by Northern Command, who were always very friendly to rugby league. Um, and that's um, Trevor Foster on the left with Roy and a couple of others uh, before they were playing a rugby union match in London. Um, anyway, he, um, in August 1944, Roy broke his leg 
I don't know if this was in a match, in a training accident, or, or a car crash, or what. He did play some rugby union that season, but he had not played league for Barrow, or anyone else. Barrow had started playing again and retained his registration. 1945 to 46 season, Roy was still in the army. You know, a lot of soldiers had to stay on, there were things to do after the war, and he was needed by his, his regiment. And he was playing rugby league for Barrow. He was based in West Yorkshire and travelling to Barrow, and even after the war finished, travelling still wasn't, wasn't great. During the season, it was agreed that the British Lions rugby league team would tour Australia in 1946 at the end of the British season. The Australians were desperate for this tour. They really wanted it. It was restart International Rugby League. There's some controversy over Roy's non-selection for the tour. Was it because the Australians didn't want a black tourist? Roy believed this to be the case. They certainly, for immigration, had a white labour policy at that time. Um, and the tour is often mentioned as the one where the black player wasn't chosen. I have to say, I don't accept this. Um, Roy was not emigrating to Australia. The Australians wanted the tour. Would they have risked Great Britain saying no if they were not allowed to bring the players they wanted? His form for Barrow was good, but reading the match reports, it's not as good as when he was playing for Dewsbury a couple of years earlier, um, where he really stood out in the match reports. Um, 18 months later, he was capped for Great Britain. He was playing better. Had he displayed that form in the first half of 1945-46, because the team was chosen finally in March, there were trial games in January, he probably would have had more chance of being selected. Four experienced wingers were chosen. The clinching evidence for me is an article in the Yorkshire Post on the players who missed out on the tour selection. The Yorkshire Post journalists knew about Roy through his time at Dewsbury, but Roy's name is not mentioned. Um, I mean, this is one we could go, people, historians go on debating and debating. Um, Roy made his, as I said, his Great Britain debut at Oddsall in Bradford, December 1947, scored two tries and a 25-9 win to give the Lions a 2-1 series win. He'd stayed at Barrow, but Barrow was struggling, and at the age of 29, in July 1948, he signed for the reigning champions, Warrington. One of Warrington's wingers was the legendary Australian Brian Bevan, biggest try scorer in the history of the sport. Bevan was never going to be left out of the team by Warrington. And he'd always be first choice. One of the Roy's competitors for the other wing slot was a player called Albert Johnson, who had been on the 1946 tour. He was an established international. <coughs> Roy finished his first season at Warrington with 22 tries in 29 appearances, which is a very good return. Um, he was the second highest scorer after Bevan. The team reached the championship final. Roy scored, but they were beaten 13-12 by Huddersfield. That's a photo of Roy, who's the one in the middle, um, playing for Warrington against <laughs> Highview. view. Um, looks like he's having his head taken off. Um, which is legal, isn't he? Anyway... At the time of his move, Roy said he was interested in becoming a player coach. Our coaching was only, again, a whole, we could have spent a whole evening talking about this, coaching was only just go, getting going, as different from training, just to get players fit. Um, Jim Sullivan had done this at Wigan, and earlier a player called Harold Wagstaff had, had done the same at Huddersfield for a time. But such opportunities were very few, and rugby league coaching was in its infancy. I think this shows how far thinking Roy was and ahead of his time, which is why I used that for the book. In the autumn of 1949, at the age of 30, Roy joined Hull FC for a £1,200, which for a 30-year-old then was a high transfer fee uh, for a player of that age. However, an injury meant he only played a couple of times for Hull that season. Hull were one of the oldest rugby league clubs. That's uh, Roy in the, the team. And Hull, and this is Rugby League Review saying Hull was a rugby league outpost but not outcasts. Um, so he, he didn't play, but he, Hull were one of the oldest clubs. 
but they'd had little success since the war. Um, in the summer of 1950, Roy was made club captain and played regularly, more at centre than on the wing. A wing very much need, winger very much needs pace, the centre doesn't so much, maybe more guile and uh, skill. There was a marginal improvement in the team's performance, and a year later, Roy became player coach, initially in an acting capacity, and then permanently in September 1951. Hired some young players, such as Tommy Harris, who'd come up from South Wales, I think Newbridge from memory, and Johnny Whiteley, who was one of the legendary players in Harley, only died less than a year ago, and both sides of the city, Hull and Hull Kingston Rovers, is a big rivalry, but they united in uh, their memories of Johnny Whiteley. And there was a potential and something to build on. should be remembered that the directors in these days still chose the team and signed the players. And Roy was given them to coach. He probably had some say, but at the end of the day, the, um, the directors were in charge. In an interview, Roy said he intended to improve the team's fitness. Gradually, a running track was introduced, and all the players, not just the backs, had sprint training, had these burly prop forwards wearing spikes. This was something new for them. Roy kept records of the times and expected improvements. His experience in the army, we can see, was invaluable for his fitness work. This must have what he did with both the physical training and then the rehabilitation. I suspect rugby, most rugby league training at this time it was in the evening, a few laps around the field and playing touch and pass. Roy was much more formal, got the players fitter. Um, Roy and his family moved to Hull and then settled in Beverly near Hull. Hull finished third in the league and lost in the championship semi-final to Wigan. Roy had a great season as a player and started to build a side that would see, see a lot of success over the rest, in the rest of the decade. And his appointment as player coach is believed to be the first time a black coach had been appointed in a major sport to coach a professional team. Time doesn't allow, sadly, for a detailed account of his work with Hull in the 50s and early 60s. As well as his fitness and coaching work, Roy's man management and kind of use of psychology were very effective, again drawing on his rehabilitation work in the army. And he was accepted and respected by the players. Johnny Whiteley said, yeah, that's the two of them on the left, and that's Roy with the championship trophy in 1956. Anyway, Johnny Whiteley said, the players at Hull, we were from the back streets with no education. Roy showed us the other side of the road. He said we could change and move on in life as well as sport. Instead of making do with living in a one-up, one-down terrace, I finished up in a nice area with a three-bedroom semi. He was such a man of the world, he was unique. We players looked up to him as a father figure, which is a really remarkable um, tribute. Roy could be a disciplinarian if required. He stressed the importance of training. And if players couldn't train, they didn't play. He would take the team away from Hull before to a seaside resort or somewhere they could train, before important cup or championship playoff games. The installation of floodlights for training, which came in the mid-50s, must have helped him. He gradually played less. He was more injury-prone, getting older. His last match as a player was in December 1955, when he was nearly 37, which is a good age for a rugby player to stop. Although for a couple of years, it was noticeable in the papers, they'd refer to him as player coach, although he had no, I think he maybe played for the second team once. Something else he did in the late 50s, he used a cine camera to film matches with the aim of building up a library of films and to allow players to watch and learn from them. Again, years before anybody else had thought of this. In the 50s, under Roy's direction, Hull won the championship twice. They were runners-up once, reached two Challenge Cup finals and four Yorkshire Cup finals. One myth that should be knocked on the head is about a player called Pin McMillan. In the late 50s, rugby league play clubs started to sign South African rugby union players. Um, as with Welsh imports, some were successful, some were not. In September 1957, Pim McMillan joined Hull from South African Rugby Union. 
Roy went to pick him up from Manchester Airport. McMillan, who was white, and remember, this was at the height of apartheid in South Africa, um, was probably surprised to find that a black man was his new coach at home, a black man would have been carrying his bags. There's no record of Roy having any animosity towards McMillan. He played regularly for the second team. In any event, the directors picked the team. Macmillan, at times hampered by injury, never really got a chance, from what I can see. His cause wasn't helped by Hull signing other players in his position in the fullback or centre. He was offered the chance to join other clubs, but did not do so. In early 1959, he was released by Hull and went back to South Africa. 1961, Hull reached the Challenge Cup semi-final. The team had grown old and were in decline. One significant event at this time was Roy's role in helping Hull sign Clive Sullivan. He went on to be the first black captain of the Great Britain Rugby League team and the first black captain of a British team in a major sport. He led them to the 1972 World Cup. Um, Clive died young and is remembered with reverence throughout Hull having played for both teams. If you, ever, if you come off the M62 going into Hull, uh, the road you will go on is Clive Sullivan Way. And there isn't really a bigger tribute than, than that. Um, Tommy Harris left, and in May 1963, Roy and Irene took over a, a pub in Dewsbury, more than an hour's drive from Hull. And remember, this is before the motorway network. Um, <coughs> Hull was a bit of an outpost. The Hull chairman claimed that this would not affect Roy's commitment to the club. However, after a poor start to the 63-64 season, Leeds were looking for a new coach. Roy got the job, replacing his old army comrade, Trevor Foster. But Trevor agreed to stay on to coach the second team. In 1961, Leeds had won the league, but hadn't found sustained success. Roy saw that the club had great potential. He was largely able to pick the team and had more influence over signing players. A whole new challenge was to begin. At Hull, Roy's great teams were built on a strong pack. Get the defence right first. At Leeds, after a couple of seasons strengthening the side, he developed a team with young backs playing superb attacking rugby. Um, they finished top of the league four seasons running from 1967 to 1970. The actual league title was um, decided by playoffs. There were too many teams in one league to all play each other, so the top four would play off for the championship, so the top eight sometimes. Once again, Roy wasn't afraid to innovate. In 1966, Leeds signed an international prop forward called Ken Eyre from Hunslet. Roy thought he was overweight and put him on a diet. No beer. Sugar, bread, potatoes or pastries. He had to have lean meat, fish, cheese, eggs and fresh vegetables. That was acceptable. Roy's other problem was that the, play, the cover for the player in the second team, a young forward, was over it, also overweight. And he had to do the same. And the young player's mum was quoted in the local paper. What does Mr Francis say we can have to eat today? <laughs> Player lost two stone. What other coach was thinking about diet at that time, let alone telling a 1960s rugby league prop forward that he couldn't drink beer? <laughs> I don't know if the football fans among you might remember, I've just read Arsene Wenger's autobiography. When he came to Arsenal, he immediately started talking about diet and pasture and what he ate before a game, and he was ridiculed. Roy was doing stuff about diet 30 years before Arsenal had been raising those points. Roy never won the Challenge Cup as a coach. Twice, Hull had got to Wembley, they'd been beaten both times. In 1968, Leeds reached Wembley to play local rivals Wakefield Trinity. They won 11-10 when Don Fox Mr. Kick in front of the posts in the last minute. If there is ever a piece of video, the BBC owned but should be burnt. It's the one showing Don Fox missing that kick. It's just a bit of time this challenge comes to. The game should never have been played. Storms and heavy rain made it a farce. It's known as the water splash final. There's a whole book on it. 
by a friend of mine, David Hitchliff, who used to be MP for Wakefield. And it, it's, um, you know, it, it's, the whole thing is a travesty. What's interesting is there's very little comment from Roy in the press reports and David's book about the final. One Leeds player said that Roy was disappointed his side could not show off their skills in one of the game's great occasions. A few months later, Roy's Leeds team won the Yorkshire Cup, so he'd now won, as a coach, all the game's traditional trophies. However, in the off-season, between the two finals, they said he was working holiday for a month. The only problem with this coaching consultant idea was that North's had a coach at the time, former South African rugby union international Colin Greenwood. He played league in England before joining North as a player, and then had become coach. Greenwood, not surprisingly, said he was leaving the club, Though, to be fair, he persuaded not to, the players not to go on strike over his downgrading at Roy's arrival. And again, to be fair to Greenwood, I think he, from the very comprehensive history I've got of North Sydney um, by Andrew Moore, I think he had improved things on, on what they were. Um, he, Andrew Moore also says that Australian rugby league was less professional than the British game at this time. It's the complete reverse today. Anyway, North's offered... Um, Roy a contract for three years to start in 1969. He didn't make a final decision until he returned to Leeds, but he decided to take the deal. It was not a success. North didn't recognise that both at Hull and Leeds, Roy had taken at least three years to build a side to gradually get it right. You don't get overnight success, as many clubs seem to think you do today. He was the only full-time coach in Australia and was well paid. The Australian game was very much focused on their 22-match league competition. It wasn't like they didn't have anything like the Challenge Cup, which was as big for the British te English teams as it was as the league. North's improved, but a four-run at the end of the season saw them finish seventh outside the playoffs. For 1970. Roy signed a number of new players, including fellow Welshman Jim Mills. Jim managed to get sent off twice in his early games, and at this stage in his career had not developed the ball handling and offloading skills that characterised his game at Witness when he returned from Australia. Jim still lives here in Cheshire. He's a lovely guy, huge. You know, he, when he retired from rugby, ran a nightclub in Witness. I, I wrote, co wrote his, his, I wrote his biography. And this Australia business, I'd actually researched quite thoroughly and found that altogether he was sent off three times. We used to meet in his kitchen and his wife Ruth would prepare some lunch for a sheep.